between quarter to 12 and 12 o'clock, the body of a woman was found outside number 29 Gowan Avenue. That woman has been identified as Jill Dando, the television presenter. Good morning, the time is seven o'clock. You're watching Breakfast News from the BBC. Jill Dando was one of the biggest names in British television. A primetime presenter known to millions for her warmth and charm. What do you think? I don't know what it is, I don't know what She was beautiful and, and she was very bright. And somebody killed her? For what reason? What kind of motive could there have been? At just 37, she was shot dead on her doorstep. Barry George, a local man with learning difficulties, was wrongly convicted for her murder. Did you kill Jill Dando, Mr George? Yes, sir. We questioned about a murder and you haven't done it. Somewhat overwhelming and um, just absolute ludicrous. Since his release, the police have failed to identify her killer. Here is a list of suspects in the case. Now, with access to thousands of pages of police and legal documents, we ask why the case remains unsolved and reveal the theories that have confounded detectives. Was it potentially a contract killer? Was it a stalker? They just didn't know. Hitmen, criminal gangs, and a trail of evidence from Belgrade to London. If something that significant, because it happened on the day of the murder, has been missed, um, then we have to ask the question, what else could have been missed throughout the investigation? A 20-year mystery. April the 26th, 1999. Just after 11.30. Jill Dando parks her car outside her home in Fulham, London. She'd just done some shopping. As she approaches her front door, a man comes up behind her. He quickly restrains her and then shoots her with a single bullet to the head. There's a lot of blood. Confidentially, it looks like it's Jill Dando. The ambulance will be coming. That's the lady's chest going up and down. Oh, my God, no, I don't think she's alive. Good evening. One of Britain's most popular television presenters, our BBC colleague Jill Dando, has died after being attacked outside her London home. She's such a sweetheart, so it's so horrible. She, she wasn't conscious when I saw her. The brutal killing that today stunned everyone here at the BBC Television Centre. I was in the newsroom at the BBC when the news came through that Jill had been shot, and people were utterly shocked by it. The newsroom was silent until it really began to sink in, and the team that worked closest with her were just devastated. I knew her a little. I was working there as a junior reporter, and she always had a kind word for everybody. And she was fundamentally the biggest star the BBC had. A report this morning suggests Britain. She presented the news, BBC Breakfast, Crime Watch, as well as lifestyle programmes like Holiday. We've been exploring the globe to bring you nearly a hundred holiday ideas. Sir Cliff Richard became one of her best friends after they met on the programme. I mean, Jill entered my life, really, uh, in Austria, because uh, she was doing one of her shows. Oh, it's just so glamorous. They said, we want to surprise her, because she's a bit of a fan of yours. And then suddenly, I saw her face look up, and she, she used to do this kind of excitement thing. <laughs> Everything fell apart for her there. <laughs> Jill, I'm so sorry about this. I mean, poor Prince Mark, she had no chance. I nobbled him. I, I let his tyres down so I could get here. What it is? I don't know what it is. And I waltzed her off into the sunset. So that's my first memory of actually getting to meet this woman who uh, became one of my closest friends. A friendship so close that Sir Cliff was helping to plan her forthcoming wedding 
to Dr. Alan Farthing. It was so exciting. She was going to use my Rolls Royce to arrive in the church. My gardener was so enthralled by her. He said, I'll get, I'll put, I'll get a cap on and everything. I'll drive you there. But of course, you know, the, the, the sad story is that that didn't happen. And um, she was taken from us rather cruelly, I feel. It just doesn't make sense. And to, to this day, it's still a, a mystery to me that, that they haven't been able to find her killer. Within an hour of Jill Dando's murder, her street was full of police officers. Leading the investigation known as Operation Oxborough, Detective Chief Inspector Hamish Campbell. Between quarter to 12 and 12 o'clock, the body of a woman was found outside number 29 Gowan Avenue. That woman has been identified as Jill Dando, the television presenter. Award-winning author David James Smith wrote a book about the case with some help from the police. I spoke to the senior investigation officer, Hamish Campbell, at great length afterwards, and I know that when he was arriving within 40, 50 minutes of the incident, that he believed it would be quickly solved. It was to prove anything but easy. While two neighbors thought they saw the killer leaving the scene, there was little forensic evidence. There was no CCTV coverage of the road. The gun was never found. At first, officers were struck by the apparent efficiency of the murder. Jill Dando was murdered in 30 seconds from the moment she left her car. The police admit it looks like a professional job. The circumstances make it look like it's a professional hit. No one has heard the shot. There's been one shot. Apparently, the gun has been pressed hard against her head, which has muffled the sound. Whoever did use the weapon has obviously disposed of it. It's never, ever reappeared. The person is seen. They're sort of not seen. They're able to escape, so they head off down in that direction, vanish into thin air. But then you have to ask yourself why anyone would want to carry out a professional hit on Jill Dando. It doesn't really make sense. The media was quick to provide two possible answers. Jill Dando shot dead. Was it an underworld killing? Maybe a criminal who'd been caught by Crime Watch. Hello, welcome back. There's been a lot Jill of Dando brought her charisma and charm to more than 80 appeals on the program. NATO planes which have flown more than Or could it be connected to the then ongoing conflict in the Balkans where Britain had played a key role in the NATO campaign? Jill Dando had presented an appeal to raise money for the Kosovar Albanians. We've all become aware of the humanitarian crisis facing the Balkans as thousands of people from Kosovo have left their homes and arrived on the borders of neighboring countries. The police investigation largely split into two phases. First, they focused on those who knew Jill Dando best. Detectives have already made it clear they'd be looking into Miss Dando's private life. After around nine months, they shifted towards a stalker or obsessive fan. The police are particularly keen to talk to somebody who logged into this website in November of 1998 and found out exactly where Jill Dando lived. As the investigation stretched beyond a year, the police seemed overwhelmed at times. You're back at the crime scene a year on. It, the trail has gone completely cold. We're back at the crime scene year ago, but proves the point. There are people yesterday and today who've come forward to say, I was here a year ago. But then a review of all the evidence delivered the police a new suspect, a man with learning difficulties who'd behaved suspiciously the day after the murder by trying to confirm an alibi. There was some confusion about his name. He was then known as Barry Balsara, but he'd also been called Steve Majors. Today, he's known by his original name again. This is the David James book. Um, things to do with different parts of the case. Computer, and it's just a law dictionary so that if I want to just look at anything that I'm not sure of the law on, I could always look at this. Barry George now lives in Ireland, but 20 years on remains preoccupied with the case. 
former commander of the police, uh, John O'Connor, he even turns around and um, makes a statement. Excellent leads of the Giordano case were never followed up. The Met, though, just shut their eyes to everything else once they had nicked poor Barry George. Back in 2000, when the police searched his house, they discovered he was a compulsive hoarder. They also found what they thought were a series of important leads. Amid the chaos of his home, they found all these undeveloped rolls of films. He'd been photographing hundreds of women as they walked around the streets of Fulham like a stalker. He had uh, lists of guns. He had an interest in guns. They then discovered that he's owned replica guns. He's got all this interest in the military. He was a strong suspect. Barry George became an even more compelling suspect when the police examined his criminal record. He had previous convictions for indecent assault and attempted rape. The police put him under surveillance. They secretly filmed him approaching women he didn't know. The case was building, but according to his lawyer, there was a problem. They couldn't find a connection we did an analysis to see whether there was anything in his apartment which showed he had or obsession or particular interest in Jill Dando. And actually, there was nothing. But more than a year after Jill Dando's murder, the police believed they had the connection. A forensic examination of Barry George's coat revealed a microscopic particle of gunshot residue in a pocket. That was hugely significant. So it was said that it matched the scene. It wasn't, they couldn't say, the experts couldn't say for certain that it came from the scene, but it was a match from the scene. Barry George was arrested and questioned by detectives. That coat has also been examined by a firearms expert, firearms laboratory. Did you kill Jill Dando, Mr George? Yes, sir came on the radio that they, they did have this person. And my thought was, oh, that's really good. It must have been about a year. And I heard his name is Barry Balsara, and I just froze. Did you kill Jill Dando? No, sir. Could it be? No, it couldn't be. Why would it be my brother? You know, that doesn't make any sense. Did you kill Jill Dando, Mr George? No, sir. We questioned about a murder, and you haven't done it. Just. <laughs> somewhat overwhelming and um, just absolute ludicrous. You know, it's just beggar's belief. It's 25 p.m. Three days after his arrest, Barry George was charged with the murder of Jill Dando. He stood trial at the Old Bailey. The prosecution's case relied upon the gunshot residue and eyewitnesses who thought they saw him on the road. But the two neighbours who did see the killer fleeing the scene did not identify Barry George. The detective who led the investigation and the defendant's sister were among those close to the case who were in defence barrister Michael Mansfield. During the trial, Barry George's defence team had his mental capabilities tested. The results revealed he had learning difficulties and brain damage. I have difficulties of, like, I suffer from epilepsy, I suffer from Asperger's syndrome. That does not mean to say that people should come up and start treating me as a lesser person. But the defence chose not to present the full details of his conditions to the jury. Once you put that in, there are two ramifications. One is you're never quite sure how the jury are going to view this material. Because on one level, they might say, this guy's, a, you know, he's a maniac. Yeah, of course he did it. 
But there is another problem. It would have also allowed the prosecution, and of course they knew full well that, that was the other risk, to put in the fact that Barry got previous convictions. A jury might find it difficult to acquit, even though there's no evidence. Barry George was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. The detective in charge of the case spoke about why George did it. Well, he had a lifelong history of following women, interfering with women, and attacking women in the past. And I think this was on the unfortunate culmination of many issues with this man. This is where Barry George spent the first night of his life sentence for murdering Jill Dando, Belmarsh Prison. Doubts were soon raised about the safety of the conviction. In particular, whether someone with Barry George's disabilities could have pulled off such a seemingly efficient murder. If Barry had done that, he'd have had an epileptic seizure out of shock and would probably have just fallen down. You know, he was not capable of doing such a thing. But from a wider perspective, indecent assault, he'd been jailed for attempted rape. Mm -hmm violence against women yes it had been a feature of his life yes it had i said how on earth could you do such a thing you have a mother you have a sister how could you think that that was acceptable it was not acceptable and he just knew he, he couldn't go to each person and, and say it to them but he did apologize there was no way he was going to apologize for jill dando's murder because he didn't commit it Dr. Donna Youngs is an investigative psychologist. We asked her to examine the crime scene and look for clues about the killer. It seems unlikely that it was carried out by somebody uh, with any kind of learning disability. To be able to carry out this kind of crime, we are looking for somebody with a lot of both intellectual and emotional mastery. Emotional mastery uh, in terms of confidence, a dominant personality, uh, self-sufficiency, no neediness at all, and, and not a risk-averse person. This isn't an anxious person emotionally. Intellectually, it's somebody who can take an overview, who can think abstractly, who can forward plan. Crucially, Dr Youngs believes the murderer is unlikely to have a history of sexual offences. We'd need a very clear explanation as to why there wasn't any kind of sexual behavior in this crime if it had been carried out by somebody with previous sexual offenses. There's no exploitation here. The victim isn't interfered with in any way at all. The victim's simply executed. After two appeals, Barry George was granted a retrial in 2008. By this point, a key part of the prosecution's case was seriously undermined. The microscopic speck of firearms discharge residue was not conclusive evidence that Barry George had fired the gun. The court also heard evidence his coat could have been contaminated. The judge ruled that the residue evidence could not be admitted. Barry George was acquitted on a unanimous verdict. We're really delighted to finally have justice. A huge thank you to the jury. They obviously worked very hard to ensure they correctly interpreted the circumstantial evidence in this case. 11 years on from his acquittal, Barry George is frustrated. He never received any compensation because the Justice Secretary ruled he had not sufficiently proved his innocence. I find it sad that they done what they done to me and that they didn't have no sound evidence, the truth of the real killer who's somewhere out there, you know. After the acquittal, the case was reopened. More than half a million pounds was spent on new forensic tests. But in 20 years, there have been no new arrests and no real progress. It's, for me, horrifying to think that that person still is alive and, who knows, maybe killing other people. So, has everything been done to catch that killer? We now have dozens of the police files from the first trial. Boxes full of transcripts, video and photos. 
we can build up a picture of the suspects and the theories which have swirled around this case for 20 years. Twenty years after the murder of television presenter Jill Dando, the culprit has never been caught. Barry George was wrongfully imprisoned for her murder for eight years. The case remains open, but frustrated with the lack of progress, Barry George and his sister Michelle have now given us access to police files from the first trial. I really want somebody to look at this case because very likely there is something in there that for one reason or another got missed. We're focusing on three strands of evidence. Possible links to the criminal underworld, the bullet and cartridge. But first, we travel to the Balkans. For many detectives, it was a theory that was either pretty far-fetched or simply inconceivable. But we have found more than 100 documents or messages within the police investigation that mention either Serbia or the former Yugoslavia. At the time of Jill Dando's murder, Serbia was being bombed by a NATO coalition. Britain was one of the main partners. NATO is united. There are times when we have to stand up and fight for peace. NATO intervened to prevent genocide. Serbia, led by Slobodan Milosevic, was engaged in a brutal campaign of ethnic cleansing against the Kosovar Albanians. Jill Dando presented a charity appeal to raise money for refugees. We've all become aware of the humanitarian crisis facing the Balkans as thousands of people from... This was broadcast three weeks before her murder. One of the main reasons there's been so much speculation about whether Serbia might have played some role in the murder of Jill Dando is what happened here. Just three days before she died, NATO bombs fell on this building, the state headquarters of its radio and television service. 16 people were killed, and to this day, Serbs remain outraged at the attack. To bi bilo isto sada kao, na primjer, Moskva odgađa BBC nukojernom raketom i da kažu da vi ste legitimna meta. BBC je legitimna meta. BBC ne može da bude legitimna meta. The National Criminal Intelligence Service, or ENSYS, was known as Britain's FBI. We've discovered a summary of an intelligence report they gave to Operation Oxbra. It claimed Jill Dando was murdered in revenge for the RTS bombing. The report stated that a Serbian warlord known as Arkan ordered the killing. He ran an organization called Arkan's Tigers. Um, it was a paramilitary organization closely linked to the Serbian National Intelligence Services and therefore closely linked to the state. Uh, he had a direct line into Milosevic uh, and he was not a man to be messed with. We knew you was a killer, Arkan, not as a peaceful politician. You know me as a killer? That is your reputation. Where, where is that my reputation? It's worldwide, Arkan, you know that. You know it's uh, a, a bullshit you're talking about. Serbia had a reputation for assassinating journalists. Just this month, four members of the Serbian Secret Service were convicted of the murder of editor Slavko Cheruvia. He was shot dead in Belgrade two weeks before Jill Dando was murdered. The ENSYS report claimed that a gunman travelled to Britain via Germany and France. It also highlighted a possible connection between the bullet used to kill Jill Dando and bullets used in assassinations in Germany. Because Arkham was a high priority target with an international reach, um, if a piece of intelligence had come up with his name on it uh, and his association with it, that should have been investigated at the highest levels. 
Arkan was named as a suspect in a cold case review of the investigation in 2014. By this time, he was dead. Our research indicates that the security services had assessed some of the intelligence about Serbia, but in 20 years, not one police officer ever traveled here to investigate. Nor did they ever ask for help from the Serbian police. After three inquiries to Interpol, Operation Oxbra didn't compare any bullets with Serbian methods. Ultimately, the police didn't think the Serbian theory was credible. The police felt that uh, there wasn't really time to have organized a hit squad to have come to London to assassinate Jill Dando in response to this uh, bombing of the television studios. They hadn't made any claim of responsibility for it, if that was their intent. Unlike Operation Oxborough, we spent some time in Serbia. We spoke to police and security contacts in Belgrade. None of them would go on camera, but they told us the Serbian state was unlikely to be connected to the murder. I don't believe that Arkan had a logistic motive, even if he killed a British journalist in London. If he really wanted to send this kind of message, in Serbia there was a lot of foreign journalists in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a lot of foreign journalists in Macedonia, or anywhere else in the surrounding area. In this case, certainly, Arkan, or Milošić, if they wanted to send such a message, it would have been a lot easier. But that was not the end of the Arkan connection. In 2009, the police received a tip-off about a British criminal of Serbian descent now living in the Midlands. He was alleged to have played some role in the murder by former business associates. The man whom we've met appeared to have the right profile, a history of violence, experience of guns, and a potential connection to Arkan. We're told he'd once claimed his cousin was a driver for the paramilitary leader. The suspect had denied any involvement and was eliminated from the inquiry after he showed officers his passport. He'd apparently been in Macedonia at the time of the murder. There was another strand to the Serbian intelligence within the files. In 1999, London was home to tens of thousands of Serbs, many of them angry about the NATO bombing. And Operation Oxborough received intelligence linking UK-based Serbs to the murder. Take this summary of a report apparently from Special Branch. It says the murder was in revenge for the attack on Serbian news agencies, most likely another reference to RTS. Again, a Serbian hitman. But this time, a bar in London is mentioned as a regular meeting place for the men behind the shooting. One of them is described as being a tall male with a swallow tattoo on his neck. This report was given to Operation Oxborough two days after the murder. Yet three months later, DCI Hamish Campbell seemed to be unaware of it. We have no intelligence that Jill Dando's death was the responsibility of the Serbs or the Kosovans. It's unlikely to have been Serbian, but not impossible. These comments were also at odds with events at the BBC. Some senior managers and presenters received letters and calls citing the murder as revenge for the NATO bombing campaign, including this call. Yesterday, I called you to tell you to add a few more numbers to the list because your government, and in particular your Prime Minister Blair, murdered, butchered 17 innocent young people. This call was made just after 11 a.m., the day after Jill Dando's murder. He butchered, we butcher back. The first one you had yesterday. The next one will be Tony Hall. Tony Hall, now Lord Hall, was then the BBC's head of news. Security was immediately stepped up around him. As a precaution, Tony Hall's family have now been moved to a secret location. The police note stated that the voice sounded possibly Eastern European and calm. Officers thought the same man made another call the next day. 
Listen, you and the BBC are the voice of your government. That's why your reporter is dead, because your government killed 17 innocent people. Again, the police don't appear to have followed up the intelligence. They only visited the bar mentioned in the report once and didn't find the man with the tattoo. Only one of the calls to the BBC could be traced and not the repeat caller. We've got two phone calls, possibly from the same person. We've got someone giving a report of a bar with a Serbian link in there. Uh, and there's enough in that to weave together um, the need to go and carry out a slightly more detailed investigation than they did. But the connection to Serbia is just one of the mysteries surrounding this case as we hunt for leads about the murder weapon. In this transcript, the drug dealer says, these are the bullets that were supposed to be the same bullets that killed Jill Dando. Jill Dando's death is one of Britain's highest profile unsolved murders. We now have access to thousands of pages of documents from the case. One of the few bits of physical evidence from the crime scene was the bullet and cartridge. David Pryor was the police's ballistics expert. The weapon through which it had, it had been fired was probably something like a modified barrel fitted to either a converted replica pistol or reactivated weapon. The bullet and cartridge were also distinctive. The cartridge case bore markings uh, which showed that it had been modified in some way. A set of six stab marks around the neck of the cartridge case which had been made by a handheld tool of some kind. The police hunted diligently for the gun and the source of the bullet. They got nowhere. But did a new lead emerge after Barry George's conviction? Liverpool, 2004. Journalist Graham Johnson is investigating a major criminal gun supplier, John Haas. John Haas was a top five UK gangster, and he specialised in importing heroin and gun running. In 1995, Haas was sentenced to 18 years in prison for importing heroin. Eleven months later, he was released with a royal pardon after providing information about drugs and guns. On show today, a daunting catalogue of firepower, a mini arsenal of 13 automatic weapons. Graham Johnson didn't think it smelt right and started to investigate. He sent an undercover team to target John Hass's gang. Between five and ten members of his gang who retargeted they told us how they had planted guns uh, in different locations around this city, which formed part of the fabricated evidence which John Haas had offered up to the Customs and Excise. John Haas was convicted again, this time of perverting the course of justice. But the undercover operation also threw up possible leads about the murder of Jill Dando. A drug dealer connected to John Haas was secretly recorded, claiming that bullets similar to those that killed Jill Dando had been found on a gun runner linked to the gang. In this transcript, the drug dealer says, these are the bullets that were supposed to be the same bullets that killed Jill Dando. Our undercover guys says, when you say they're the same bullets, they weren't exactly the same bullets, were they? And the drug dealer says, they had a mark on the bottom or something like that. They were the same bullets. Potentially, it's a strong lead. The drug dealer even appeared to refer to the markings on the bullet which killed Jill Dando. Peter Kilfoyle was the MP for Walton in Merseyside. 
and campaign to bring John Haas to justice. It's conceivable that the bullets came from the same source as the weapons which Haas uh, had, had uh, stashed around the city. But you must, if only because at that time in particular, there were very, very few sources in the country of these illegal weapons. It would take a degree of expertise to make the bullets and to actually resurface weapons in the way in which it was being done. The Met were given this evidence in 2005. By then, Barry George had been convicted. We found no evidence they spoke to Haas or the gun runner about the bullets or compared the bullets with the Jill Dando case. There were concerns about the reliability of the drug dealer's account. There's no suggestion that Haas or his two associates were involved in Jill Dando's murder. There are more than 70 references within the files to a contract killer, a theory which Barry George's QC always found persuasive. Whoever's going to commit this murder has to have been within a few feet of her, without her realizing. Gets to her with a gun, put up against at the back of her head, fired once, muffled sound, and disappears. And the police did receive some intelligence claiming an alleged contract killer was behind the murder. We're calling him John. According to this ENSYS report, he traveled from Spain to carry out the murder. He was known to work in a bar there. And the car he used for the assassination was suspected to have been scrapped before he flew back home. But who would want to hire John and why? 1996. We start with the murder of Stephen Cameron. It's been called the road rage murder. Stephen was... A man has been murdered on the M25. Crime Watch presenter Nick Ross uses a solemn appeal to the audience to help the police with the killing. Stephen Cameron was stabbed to death right in front of his girlfriend. The Land Rover driver got out and there was a punch up. The driver returned to his vehicle and then stabbed Mr. Cameron twice. The main suspect for that murder was one of Britain's most notorious criminals, Kenneth Noy. Brinks Matt, one of the most audacious robberies in British criminal history. It set Noy up for life. Kenneth Noy was best known for selling on gold stolen from the Brinks Matt depot. He served seven years in prison in the late 1980s. The police's case against him for the murder of Stephen Cameron largely hinged on one witness, his girlfriend, Danielle Cable. We can't show her face because she's now in witness protection. Nick Biddis led the police investigation. She is the one witness that can not only identify uh, the offender, but give full details of what actually happened on the M25. And it was Jill Dando who interviewed that crucial witness on Crime Watch. Jill's interview with Danielle was very impactive. It was emotional and it struck a chord with the public. So, of course, we were getting masses of information. By the time of Jill Dando's murder, Noy was in a Spanish prison awaiting trial back in the UK. Danielle Cable was now in hiding because of a threat to her life. But did Jill Dando's role in the interview make her a target? Operation Oxborough received some intelligence suggesting Kenneth Noy might have taken out a contract on Jill Dando because she'd interviewed that crucial witness on Crime Watch. On the surface, the information didn't sound credible. A source tipped off the police after a conversation in the pub, but there was more. The ENSYS report suggested a link between Noy and the alleged contract killer, John. It claimed John was in debt to Noy and keen to improve his image. But the police never spoke to John, even though they had his address and phone number. At the time of Jill Dando's murder, Noy was in prison. But according to our documents, detectives didn't try to find out who he was in contact with. 
Do I think that Kenneth Noy would be involved in the murder of Jill Dando, the motive being that she interviewed the main witness? I don't believe that to be the case. Having said that, of course, the information that's coming in on these documents, then it's important that you follow them up. If they didn't do that, I, I would then question whether or not uh, this inquiry has been as thorough as perhaps it uh, could otherwise have been. Noy denied any involvement, telling us the allegations were sensationalistic, ineffable, twaddle. The police concluded there was not enough evidence. Both he and John were eliminated from the inquiry. There were reasons to question the hitman theory. Jill Dando hardly lived at her home address, so a professional assassin would have needed help locating her. The police never found any evidence she was followed that day. Now, though, we've found one loose end that could have major implications for the case. If something that significant, because it happened on the day of the murder, has been missed, um, then we have to ask the question, what else could have been missed? After reviewing police files from Jill Dando's murder, we've uncovered a number of theories that the police apparently eliminated, including evidence suggesting it could have been perpetrated by London-based Serbs. Angry about Britain's role in the bombing of Serbian state broadcaster RTS. These studios were used to broadcast TV Serbia's news bulletins. But does TV Serbia and its largely civilian workforce count as a military target? One of the reasons the police didn't think this was credible was the absence of a claim for the murder from a group or individual. But supposing there had been one on the day of the murder, and detectives missed it. He butchered, we butcher back. Detectives believed a man made threatening calls to the BBC on the two days following the murder. Both cited Jill Dando's killing as revenge for the bombing of the Serbian state television service, RTS. That's why your reporter is dead, because your government killed 17 innocent people with the purpose of echoing intelligence briefings handed to the police. Yesterday, I called you to tell you to add a few more numbers to the list. Crucially, the first of these calls referred to another call made on the day of the murder. So where is that call? We found a message which appears to have come in to Operation Oxborough by three o'clock on the day of the murder, and it reads, Mail Anonymous, read the murder of journalist, Tell your Prime Minister, in Belgrade, 15 killed, so 14 more to go. It's not clear from the document if this was a call to the BBC, but we think it's linked to the other two. It seems the police did not connect them. Former Colonel in British military intelligence, Philip Ingram, believes the three calls taken together could have been a credible claim for the murder. What we have here is three phone calls, one made apparently on the day of the murder itself, and yet a connection not made with the others. What do you make of that? Well, that's significant because we'd have expected someone to try and claim responsibility on the day of the murder and soon afterwards. And, and putting it into context with the um, depth of feeling that there is amongst the Serb diaspora, um, not just with the attack on the Serbian television station, but also the appeal that Jill had made um, that will have incensed people and they'll have wanted to be seen to do something. Um, and whether that um, the claims are uh, admission to someone actually doing something to her or whether they're just wanting to vent their anger, that's the bit that we're missing. What wider questions are there then for the whole of the investigation? If something that significant, because it happened on the day of the murder, has been missed, um, then we have to ask the question, what else could have been missed? But it shows the pressure that there was on at the time with the huge amounts of information that were coming in. You know, police officers, like everyone else, are, are only human. Um, mistakes can happen, uh, but mistakes can be significant. The Met refused to answer any of our questions, but told us the case remains open so they can't comment. But they will explore any new information.
we're told the Jill Dando investigation was reviewed twice and recognized as good practice. On his retirement in 2013, Hamish Campbell told a newspaper they did everything they could to bring the person responsible to court, and they did so twice. That paper printed an apology a month later. That, to me, is them saying we had the right person, but they didn't. And if they didn't have the right person, has that person gone on and killed other people? Barry, do you think there are people out there who still think you're responsible for Jill Dando's murder? There are probably a select few people who may think, OK, he's been through the case, he's got off on a technicality, probably, or whatever. But my conscience was clear, I knew I hadn't done it. On this anniversary of her death, what message do you have for her family? Keep hoping, keep praying. Both myself and Barry want to see the person who killed Jill brought to justice. <laughs>